everybody, episode 593 of the podcast. It is Super America, the Outdoor Sports Podcast. It is Monday, September 26th, 2022. People, that is right. The final Monday of September. Where has the month gone? I don't know. But what I do know is we got a jam-packed Monday episode of the Tour Sports Podcast. So we are calling today's episode Almost Upset Saturday in College Football. We had, by my count, five different teams that if they had lost on Saturday would have led the show, including three teams that we all believe are legitimate playoff contenders. And so what we're going to do, we're going to take a step back. We're going to look at those three teams that I believe are playoff contenders that all won by less than a touchdown, easily could have lost, and ask who is the most concerning coming out of this weekend. From there, we will go to Jerry World in Dallas. Incredible game between Texas A&M and Arkansas. Texas A&M wins by two. And here is the question that I have for you. Did Texas A&M go and win that game? Or did Arkansas lose it? I think you might be surprised by my answer to that question. We will continue the conversation. Tennessee, Josh Heupel. Listen, it's not going to be an overzealous Torres. Tennessee has turned a corner. No. But I do believe this was a significant win, and it shows you how far Tennessee has come under Josh Heupel, and I am not letting this one fall under the radar. Finally, we will wrap the show. We will wrap with two losses. You can't call them upsets because one team wasn't favored. But two losses that are very concerning at two major schools that are paying big money for their head coaches. Who should be more worried? Michigan State, which fell to 2-2 two and two after getting smacked at home by Minnesota or Miami, which is now two and two back-to-back losses, uh, Texas A&M last week, and Middle Tennessee this week. With that said, though, let's get to the topic of the day. And the topic of the day, I'll tell you, I just said it a minute ago. It was funny. I was I, I finished my radio show on Saturday. As I was driving home, I talked to my buddy Garrett Carr, who writes for Aaron Torres Online, college football writer, really bright guy. And it was really funny because we were talking. We said, well, well, what's the lead story here? It was almost upset Saturday. And that's when it struck me. Almost upset Saturday is the lead of this show. I counted five different teams that easily could have lost, that won by less than a touchdown, that would have led this show. Michigan could have lost to Maryland. That would have led the show. Clemson would have lo- could have lost to Wake Forest. That could have led the show. USC could have lost to Oregon State. That could have led the show. Texas A&M, if they had lost to Arkansas, probably would have led the show. And Auburn, obviously holding on by the skin of their teeth, could have lost to Missouri, probably should have lost to Missouri. They hold on with two crazy plays, one at the end of regulation, one at the end of overtime, to get the victory. Um, And so I think if any of those five teams had lost, we probably would have led the show with them. But what I want to do now is, is rather than going through and talking, oh, Clemson did this and Michigan did that and Auburn did that. What I want to do is take those three top teams, all ranked in the top seven coming into this weekend. Michigan at number four. Uh, Who was the other one? Uh, 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 I'm blanking. Why am I blanking? Michigan at number four. Clemson at number five. That's who I was missing. USC at number seven. And ask a very simple question. Who of those three in the narrow wins is the most concerning. We'll save Texas A&M for later with, with, um, with Arkansas. And I don't think Auburn, like we don't need to talk about it. They're, they're a mess. Brian Harson isn't going to be there for very long. Whenever stuff happens at Auburn, we'll discuss it. But I want to focus on those three teams, Michigan, Clemson, USC. Which of the three is the most concerning? Which is the least concerning? And what I'll do really quick to kind of open this segment is just kind of give you a quick rundown of what happened each of the three games how we got to almost upset Saturday in college football, okay? And so let's start with the big game, uh, noon kickoff, uh, big noon kickoff, Michigan hosting Maryland. This one on paper looked like it wasn't going to be close. Michigan was a 17-point favorite. And Michigan, to its credit, I mean, they, they, they couldn't have had things go much better to start the game. Maryland fumbles the opening kickoff. Michigan scores on the first play after that fumble. They're up 7-0. I don't think I've ever seen this before. 7-0 with 14.57 left on the clock. But the one thing about Michigan, and it was a question coming into this week, is how would they do against not even great competition, but good competition, decent competition, power five competition. They were one of the few schools, one of, I can't think of very many, 
that did not play a single power five school in the first three weeks of the season. They were supposed to play UCLA. They canceled on UCLA. Um, and so they opened the year with Colorado State, Hawaii, and UConn. And I think you can legitimately argue after four weeks of college football, those are three of the worst teams in college football. Yes, I include my UConn Huskies, but part of that, UConn has an unbelievable run of injuries, starting quarterback, uh, starting running back, top wide receivers, all that stuff. The point I'm trying to make, this isn't going to be a UConn segment, I promise, is that Michigan had not only played no power five teams, but on top of that, the group of five teams that they played aren't very good. And I think you started to see that in the middle of the game, whereas the game goes on, Michigan started to look a little bit like it was on its heels. Maryland is a very dynamic offensive team. Their starting quarterback is, of course, Taulia uh, Tonga Viola. Obviously, that is Tua's younger brother. And you started to watch this game, and you saw they had Michigan sort of on their heels in this game. Now, I don't want to go overboard and say they had them on the ropes or anything like that because they didn't. As a matter of fact, of these three teams, Michigan, Clemson, and USC, this was the one that was actually the least close on paper. Michigan wins 34-27, to 27, and Michigan was actually up 34-19 to 19 before Maryland put up a late touchdown and uh, two-point conversion, which kept this one close. Uh, but they were on their heels. Uh, to its credit, Maryland did move the ball. They finished with, uh, you know, close to 400 yards of total offense. As I said, Talia Tonga Viola, 269 yards passing, 128 yards rushing for Maryland. And I think the other kind of marquee interesting thing about this game from the Michigan perspective was, of course, it is kind of the first game in the new era of Michigan football with J.J. McCarthy as their starting quarterback. We all remember the story. We all talked about this story for weeks as Michigan, Jim Harbaugh in fall camp, had the returning starter from last year, Cade McNamara, had the backup, J.J. McCarthy, and J.J. McCarthy ultimately wins the job. Cade McNamara gets hurt. J.J. McCarthy on paper looks pretty good. 18 of 26 passing, eight and a half yards uh, per completion, two touchdowns. But really the story of the game Blake Corum, the running back, 243 yards on the ground. Michigan, as a team, just pummeled Maryland at the line of scrimmage, and they get the win. Let's talk quickly about what happened in the Clemson game, because the Clemson game going on at the same time, and it was insanity in Winston-Salem against Wake Forest. Okay, And Wake Forest, say what you want about the ACC and this and that. Wake Forest is a fun team with what do we talk about on this show all the time? a defined brand, and their brand is we can't recruit the athletes on defense, but we can recruit smart quarterbacks, uh, great wide receivers. We can run this system. And keep in mind, too, Wake Forest is a program that I think has really taken advantage of kind of that uh, extra year of eligibility where they are just an older team, guys in their program, fourth, fifth, sixth year, and it shows when they take the field. And so they're playing Clemson. And it was almost the opposite of what we would expect from a Clemson team. Coming into the season, what's been the knock on Clemson? The knock on Clemson has been, we know their defense is elite. As I've told you many times, they probably have three to four guys just on this year's roster who are going to be first round picks this year, let alone 2024, 2025, et cetera. And the defense is really what was supposed to carry them throughout the season. It was the offense that was always a question coming into this year. And that was what was so shocking about what we saw in Winston-Salem on Saturday as Wake Forest basically had Clemson on its heels all game long. Sam Hartman, the Wake Forest quarterback, 337 yards passing. Clemson, 10 penalties, including, I would guess, five or six pass interference penalties where they just had no idea what was going on but it was actually the offense from Clemson who got them the victory. DJ Uyangalale, who we have been so critical of on this show, myself certainly included, he came up with big play after big play. Finished with 371 yards passing, five touchdowns, and it was the Clemson offense, not the defense, that got them the win. Finally, let's go out to the West Coast. Pac-12-ish after dark, as I tell you, if USC is going to the Big Ten in two years, if you see, we can't call it Pac-12 after dark when we got a, a pseudo Big Ten team playing. But what we saw uh, was almost exactly what I told you last Saturday on last Monday's show when it came to USC. 
When you look at USC, as I told you on Monday's show, the big thing with USC was this. I think the big question with USC, everybody's been saying, well, what happens? The defense isn't great. Well, what happens when USC gets doesn't score a million points? And what I told you was this. Yes, the offense is going to have to carry them, but just because the defense gives up a lot of yards does not mean that they are a bad, awful defense. They came into this weekend, ranked number one in the country in turnover margin, forced 10 turnovers with zero turnovers of their own, and Saturday, that was what won them the game. They forced four turnovers against Oregon State. It was really the running game with Travis Dye. And then Caleb Williams in what was by far his worst game as the USC quarterback does hit Jordan Addison late and USC gets the win in Corvallis. So those are three teams that I think we all think can make the playoff that struggled on Saturday and easily could have lost. Michigan wins by seven. Clemson wins by seven. USC on the road wins a narrow one 17 to 14. And so the question now becomes, well, if you're looking at these three games and if you're looking at these three teams, all three are currently ranked in the top six. So we think in college football right now, the top three are pretty clear. Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama in some order. You pick and choose who you want. Some people are saying Ohio State should be number one after Saturday. I'd still go Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama based on what I've seen. But the next three in line are Michigan, are Clemson, and are USC. And so the question now becomes, after all three could have lost on Saturday, who should you be most concerned about? Well, I'm going to work in reverse order, and I will say of the three teams mentioned, the one that I'm actually least concerned about, and it's going to surprise you, it is the USC Trojans. And there's a few reasons why. First of all, keep in mind, nobody really had that high expectations for USC coming into the year. Now, they had expectations. I think there were a lot of people that thought, you know, if things break right, they can, make the, they can certainly win the Pac-12 and compete for a college football playoff berth. But I think most people thought 9-3 and three type team, 10-2 and two type team, and if everything breaks right, then maybe, just maybe, they can compete for a playoff berth. So why do I bring it up? It is because if we are talking about who we are the most concerned about, we had the lowest expectations for USC. Most people thought they were going to lose two to three games minimum in the regular season, so we can't be surprised that they went on the road against a good Oregon State team and nearly lost. But why I'm not concerned about them is a few things. One, they won the way that everybody said they could not win. And I think this is an important part, right? Everybody told us, if they don't score 50 points, they're not beating you. If they don't score 45 points, they can't beat you. Well, they went on the road against a good team. Oregon State's a good team. Made a bowl game last year, went 8-5. and five. Oregon State's a pretty good team. And USC went on the road and won because of their defense and their run game, not because of their potential number one overall draft pick in the 2024 draft at quarterback Caleb Williams, not because of all those superstars on the edge, including the Bolitnikov winner, Jordan Addison. They won for two reasons. One, they, they won by lining up and running the ball right at Oregon State. And that's been the question about USC. We know they have the skill position. We know they have the quarterback. Do they have the guys in the trenches? Well, on Saturday night at Oregon State, they had the guys in the trenches because as a team, USC rushed for 153 yards, 177 yards, excuse me, including 133 from Travis Dye, who played last year at Oregon. So they did what they're supposed to do. And then on top of that, and I think this is important, they forced another four turnovers. And so listen, do I believe in my heart of hearts that USC – can continue to win games by forcing three to four turnovers per game because they have 14 turnovers right now through four games. I'm not great at math, and that's something we'll learn about quite a bit on this show, but that comes out to what? Three and a half turnovers per game? Three. And, I don't think they can force three and a half turnovers per game from the rest of the season on out. But why I'm not concerned is because they won the way that you told me they couldn't. They won by running the ball, by controlling the clock, by making big plays on defense. And it wasn't Caleb Williams and it wasn't Jordan Addison. And so when you factor that in, when you look at the rest of the schedule, it's pretty manageable. And I told you that last week. You look at this USC schedule. They do not play Oregon, which is currently ranked in the top 25. They do not play Washington, which all of a sudden looks awesome. Now, they do have to play Utah in a few weeks, but they get two home games before that. 
kind of get right, figure things out. They play Arizona State next week, who they should destroy. They then play a good Washington State team before they get to Utah. And later in the year, they do have UCLA, who I think is pretty good. And they do get Notre Dame at home. But I think we all know even Notre Dame, even with the loss, uh, even with the win on Saturday, they're a team that's a work in progress and USC should win. And so I'm the least concerned about USC because they won the way people said they couldn't win. And because they make plays on defense and they win, they, they prove that they can win when their defense doesn't, when their offense doesn't score 35, 40, 45 points. Interesting game, fun game from USC. Here's the next question. Who else am I least concerned about? I'm actually, again, going to surprise you. And I'm going to say the Clemson Tigers. And why it's the Clemson Tigers is because it's, 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 it's the exact same as USC, only it's the exact opposite. I was told, and I did tell you, I said it, we were, we, we've all been in agreement. Clemson has a national championship caliber defense. The question is, will they get enough out of their offense to win big games? And so when I look at Saturday, listen, I don't want to call it a best case scenario for Clemson because I, I don't believe that it's a best case scenario for Clemson. But what I do believe with Clemson is that it actually worked out pretty well. Because if you look at Wake Forest, and again, criticize Wake Forest all you want, but Wake Forest is probably the best the best offense that Clemson will see between now and the college football playoff, if they make the playoff. I think it's the best offense they'll see the rest of the regular season. Maybe that's the best way to put it, okay? And so they did not play well on defense. The offense had them on their heels all game. And they found a way to win with their own offense, which is something that we've questioned from day one. And so, listen, I've been very critical of DJ Uyangalale because Uy, Uyangalale, I always trip up his name. I've always been very critical of DJ Uyangalale, but this guy was awesome on Saturday. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say it was the best game of his career, 371 yards passing, five touchdowns, no interceptions. But why it was so important is not just because he put up those stats. He could have done that against Furman. He could have done that against Louisiana Tech. He could have done it against Louisville, Boston College, some of these teams that Clemson should beat handily. He did it in a game where Clemson needed every single one of those points. And more importantly, he did it late in the game. Clemson trailed 20 to 14 going into the second half, 21 third quarter points for DJ. And overall, Clemson outscored Wake in the fourth quarter and overtime by a final score of, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, final score. They, they outscored them 23 to 10 in the fourth quarter and in overtime. And so I bring it up because he made the plays when he needed them. And I would also say credit to the defense because I think the defense did a very good job as well with Wake Forest coming into the fourth quarter with 35 points being held to 10 over the final two to the final fourth quarter and in overtime. And so I'm not going to belabor the point, but I'll tell you Clemson, I think needed a win where they, where their offense just had to make plays where the offense wasn't a luxury, where you couldn't kind of baby DJ Uyangalale. They did it. They got the win. I'm impressed. Now the schedule with them is tougher and the expectations are higher than with USC. They still have to play, oh, by the way, next week. They get NC State at home, really good team. On top of that, beyond that, later in the year, Florida State is now ranked. Florida State's a good football team. Florida State's 4-0, playing their best football since some guy named Jimbo Fisher was rocking and rolling about seven, eight years ago. They have Notre Dame late in the year. As I just said, Notre Dame I don't think is great. Miami I don't think is great. But the point I'm trying to make, if you're Clemson, you needed to see that from your offense. You did, and I'm not going to lie. I'd feel pretty good if I was Dabo Sweeney right now, although you got to turn around quickly and play NC State. Finally, I'll say this. People are going to be surprised. The team that I am most concerned about coming out of Saturday, I do think it's the Michigan Wolverines. People are going to say I'm crazy and they just made the playoff and you're overreacting. If you watch that game, I'm just going to say it, and it's going to be unpopular and people are going to disagree. I do wonder if they made the wrong decision at quarterback, and I think it's too early to tell. And to be clear, I understand why Jim Harbaugh made the decision that he did. And we've talked about it a million times. But for people who do not remember all the details, remember, Michigan makes the playoff last year, wins the Big Ten. They have a quarterback named Cade McNamara, but he's very limited, doesn't have a huge arm, certainly not athletic, can't make plays with his feet. 
And the backup was a kid named J.J. McCarthy. Five-star kid, crazy athlete, super strong arm, can make all the throws. And it felt like it was only a matter of time before J.J. McCarthy got the job, which he did over the last couple of weeks. The problem with J.J. McCarthy, like so many super talented players, is that too often you rely on your talents almost blindly. And if you go back to last year, J.J. McCarthy had a couple really big plays, kind of bad decisions at the worst possible time. And I'm not blaming him. I'm not saying he's terrible. I'm not saying he's the worst thing ever. But remember, late in the Michigan State game, the only game they lost in the regular season, he had a really bad fumble that cost Michigan not ultimately the game, but put, they, it cost them points, which ultimately cost them the game. Uh, he had some other weird decisions at various other points to the point that late in the year, Jim Harbaugh just didn't play him. And so I get why this move was made. I get that Jim Harbaugh and Michigan kind of sat there and said, you know what? We've seen what Cade McNamara can do for us, and he can win us a lot of games in the regular season. But to beat Ohio State again, to take care of business, potentially if we actually get back to the playoff, we're going to need more out of the quarterback position. I get it. But if you watch the game, J.J. McCarthy had a couple really weird plays, a couple big plays for loss where he took bad, you know, bad sacks at the worst possible time. I don't think Michigan's defensive front is quite as good as it was last year. They did have three sacks and five tackles for loss. I don't think it's quite as good as last year where they had Aiden Hutchinson, who was obviously a first round pick. And I'm going to tell you, you factor in Michigan with a tough schedule that starts this week at Iowa. And I know everyone's going to make fun of Iowa. And Iowa's actually a nine point underdog in the Bedford Sportsbook. But you have Penn State still. I know Michigan State is terrible. We've been talking about them. But Michigan State has had Michigan's number. And late in the year, you, of course, have Ohio State. I am most worried about Michigan coming out of Saturday. That was a game that was too close for comfort at home. And you got to pick it up as you continue into conference play. Woo! Good first segment of the Air Tour Sports Podcast. This is what I do. You want to take a quick break. I said there were five teams that if they had lost would have led the show. Michigan, Clemson, USC, we just talked about. Next, I want to talk about Texas A&M. They beat Arkansas 23 to 21. And so the question becomes, Arkansas fumbles on the goal line, return for a touchdown from Texas A&M. They miss a field goal late. And the question is, did Texas A&M win that game or did Arkansas lose it? I think you might be surprised by what I say. We're going to take a quick break. I will be right All right, we're going to get back to the show in a minute. But before we do, I want to thank once again our presenting sponsor, Betfred Sportsbook and the Betfred app. And listen, I've told you about Betfred at this point, but I'm going to tell you again because I love working with them. Uh, they are one of Europe's biggest sports books, most well respected sports books. They've been around since 1967, over 1,600 shops across the UK, and they have come to the US in a big way, okay? They are the presenting sponsor, the gambling sponsor of the Cincinnati Bengals. They are the gambling sponsor of the Colorado Rockies, of the Denver Broncos. And they are, of course, the presenting sponsor of all things Aaron Torres Media. The Aaron Torres Podcast, the College Football Betting Show. Oh, by the way, some stuff that is still yet to come. And what I love about working with Betfred is some companies say they care about the customers. Nobody takes care of their customers quite like Betfred. I've told you. First pitch at the Rockies game, Betfred betters have thrown it out. Um, you know, tailgates outside of the Broncos games. I told you this. They are flying two fans to London for the Denver Broncos game when Denver plays in London in a few weeks against Jacksonville. Nobody takes care of their customers like Betfred. And here's the great thing. They got a great offer for first-time users. Tell them Aaron Torres sent you. Link is in the show description. But if you bet 50 on any college football or NFL game this weekend, Betfred automatically gives you 250 in free bets courtesy of the Betfred app. Bet 250, get 250 courtesy of Betfred. So make sure that you are following Betfred, Betfred Sports on Twitter. They do incredible work and they are an incredible presenting sponsor of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. Really quickly, I should mention as well. Thank you again to Bracket Fanatics. Bracket Fanatics is, of course, the uh, is, is is our sponsor for our NFL Pick'em Challenge, okay? Bracketfanatics.com. Uh, they, they, they helped us in March Madness. They are back, and we are doing an NFL Pick'em Challenge. And here's the cool part. $100 weekly cash prizes, $1,000 season-long cash prize. And so the cool part is if you have not entered yet, it is not too late. Go ahead, go to bracketfanatics.com, 
join bracket. You're going to want to join Torres and you can enter for week four of the NFL coming up automatically entered for a hundred dollar cash prizes. And again, a thousand dollar season long cash prize bracketfanatics.com join bracket Torres. Tell them Torres sent you. I'm just giving away cash. Take advantage people. All right, everybody. I'm back. Good to be back. Good to be back. I do want to switch gears, sort of, but I kind of want to keep the conversation going from segment one, because obviously if you listen to segment one, you know that I believe that there were probably five different teams that if they had lost on Sunday, Saturday would have led today's Monday Aaron Torres sports podcast. We already talked about three of them. Now let's go ahead and talk about another one uh, with just maybe the wildest game in a wild day of college football, Texas A&M. They play Arkansas in Jerry World, Southwest Classic, and in a game that just defied explanation. Texas A&M survives by the skin of their teeth. Final score, 23-21, to thanks to two absolutely insane plays that both went Texas A&M's way. And so coming out of the game, and this is what I want to talk about now, there's a lot of people that are asking, did Texas A&M actually win this game? Or did Arkansas actually lose this game? I see both sides. I want to give you my opinion, and I do think it's going to be a little bit surprising. Now, obviously, look, we everyone knows we have a lot of Arkansas fans that listen to this show. Woo, pig, suey, big pig invasion. We know how it goes. And if an Arkansas fan is listening saying, a and didn't beat us, we lost that game, I can't really disagree with you from your perspective, from the perspective of an Arkansas fan. You look at that game, Arkansas goes up 14-0 early, moving the ball at will, doing what Arkansas does, running the ball right at Texas A&M. And Texas A&M, like basically very few teams over the last two years of college football, really didn't have many answers for Arkansas. Arkansas is up 14-0 after the first quarter. And then about midway through the second quarter, Arkansas is up 14-7 when the first of those two absolutely crazy plays happened. We all know what it was, but for people who did not watch, let's just share it really quick. K.J. Jefferson, Arkansas's very reliable, very trustworthy. I think he's right up there with Hendon Hooker. We're going to talk about next segment as one of the most underrated and underappreciated players in college football. Uh, K.J. Jefferson, after driving Arkansas down the field, uh, they're on the three-yard line. He's a big, physical, tough runner himself. All he's got to do is hold on the ball, punch it in. Arkansas goes up 21-7. to He jumps over the pile, tries to punch it in, and right as he is diving in, the ball gets knocked out from K.J. Jefferson, and not only is there no touchdown, but A&M then picks it up and returns it thanks to not one but two players. One handed it off to the other. 85, 90 yards, whatever it ended up being, to score a touchdown. So Arkansas driving in, three-yard line, jump, try to punch it in, gets knocked out, A&M returns it. 90 whatever yards the other way. And so that's the first crazy play. Arkansas would have gone up 21 to 7. Instead, it becomes a 14-13 game because Texas A&M for I, I don't know why I was I was busy hosting radio. I must have missed it, but they decided to go for two. After that, and when I say I was hosting radio, I, I missed that specific play. I was obviously watching the game, otherwise I would not be talking about it. But after that, the game is kind of back and forth. AM is down 14-13, but by mid to late second, th- you know, second quarter into the third quarter, they start to take control of the game. They're up 23 to 14. Arkansas then regains control. It, they, they cut it to 23 to 21. And then if you've watched Sports Center, been on social media, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, you know what happened from there. Texas A&M, they miss a field goal, give the ball back to Arkansas. Arkansas gets themselves in field goal range. Uh, It is worth noting the Arkansas kicker, who obviously won this game last year, uh, he lines up for about a, what what would it have been, a 40-something yard field goal, drops back, kick is up, kick has the length, kick has the distance, kick has the height, and it goes off. The top of the upright. Literally, listen, I'm sure it's happened before. I've been watching football for about 30 years now. I have never seen a kick go up over the upright, hit the top of the upright, fall the other direction, only that is exactly what happened. Arkansas was down 23 to 21 at the time. Had that kick been good, they would have taken the lead with just a few minutes left and essentially won that game. 
Instead, the clock runs to zeros and Texas A&M wins 23 to 21. And if you watch the game and if you look at the box score, it's hard not to argue that Texas, that Arkansas lost the game more than Texas A&M won it. Arkansas had more total yards. They had more passing yards. They had more rushing yards. They completed a higher percentage of third downs and Arkansas lost the game. I think most Arkansas fans certainly feel that they lost the, that they, they, they lost the game more than A&M won it. Uh, and I'm sure maybe some A&M fans feel the same way as well. I, however, feel a little bit different. I actually want to go ahead and give credit to A&M for winning this game. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to make me really unpopular in 13 SEC cities that all hate Texas A&M. I'm not saying we should forgive Texas A&M for the App State loss. I'm not saying that Texas A&M is back. I'm not saying that they have all the answers. But what I am saying Over the last two weeks, and specifically on Saturday night at Jerry World, I do think we are starting to see the bare bone skeleton of what Texas A&M, we thought they could be in the preseason and what they could still be, which is a 9-10 to win team this season. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not saying Texas A&M has figured everything out. What I am saying is I have seen something from Texas A&M that makes me believe that they could potentially reach the potential and expectation of this year. And to go back to the whole, like, did Arkansas lose the game today and then win it debate? Let me just say this. Yes, Arkansas had two crucial plays go against them that cost them points. But let's also not just dismiss the fact that AM was really good defensively after the first quarter. I went back and looked it up. Okay, so first of all, those first two drives, yes, Arkansas had all the answers, right? That's what a good coaching staff does. You script the first few series on offense, you should have success. And Texas A or Arkansas, to its credit, did. 147 yards, two of the first three possessions, score touchdowns, they're up 14 0. Yet over the rest of the game, Texas AM also has some highly paid defensive coaches as well. And they held Arkansas to 268 yards over the final three quarters. And so if you look at the game, it really is a tale of two stories. To say that Arkansas lost it, is a little bit disingenuous because basically 40% of their offense came in the first quarter. And after that, Texas A&M did a good job. I looked it up after the KJ Jefferson uh, fumble on the three yard line, Texas A&M forced three straight punts before Arkansas was finally able to get the ball moving again. So to me, one, when I look at Texas A&M and I talk about not only what happened Saturday night in, in Dallas, in Arlington, but what could happen going forward I think that defense finally stepped up in a way that we were all hoping against a really good Arkansas run defense. I'm not saying they stopped them because nobody stops that Arkansas run offense, but against that Arkansas run offense, which is top 10 in the country, Texas A&M actually did a pretty admirable job, certainly better than Cincinnati and South Carolina did later in the year. And so why I'm sort of intrigued by Texas A&M good job on defense against a very good run offense But then on top of that, I got to say this. I do think they're starting to figure it out on offense as well. Now, I'm not saying they're there yet. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not throwing rose petals at Max Johnson's feet. And I know that a lot of people would say, oh, Max Johnson, he only threw for 151 yards against the worst secondary in college football. Okay. Yes. Arkansas has given up a lot of yards through the air. And yeah, in a perfect world, you want your quarterback to throw for 300 yards like Bobby Petrino's quarterback did two, three weeks ago, right? At the same time, here's the other thing. Everybody focuses on Arkansas having the worst secondary in college football or the worst pass defense in college football. They also have a great pass rush and came into this weekend leading college football in sacks. And so why I am impressed by Max Johnson, it's not always the plays that you make, but it is the plays that you do not make and the mistakes that you do not make. And this is why I like this guy for our, for Texas A&M's offense. I'm not saying he's Bryce Young. I'm not saying he's C.J. Stroud. I'm not saying he's K- uh, uh, Caleb Williams. But at the same time, not every team needs every quarterback to be the, the future first-round pick. At some point, and some teams, they just need their quarterbacks to be competent, reliable, trustworthy, and that's who Max Johnson has been. In two games, Max Johnson has not been elite, but two touchdowns, and more importantly, no interceptions. Haynes King, against much inferior competition, 
three touchdowns, two interceptions, could not move the ball. And so Max Johnson, simply by taking care of the ball, he is just good enough of an athlete where he can move. He's got some wiggle. He had 39 yards rushing. It does change this offense. And I'm not saying they're Ohio State overnight, but at the same time, look at what we saw on Saturday. The quarterback play is trustworthy, which you know what that does? It keeps defenses honest, and it opened up the run game. This is the incredible thing to me in looking back at Texas A&M over their four games this year. They have a dynamic, world-class sprinter at running back named Devon A-Chain, okay? This kid is like 4-2 speed. And with Max Johnson in the, in the games at quarterback, he's been a completely different player. You know why? Because Max Johnson keeps defenses honest, because you have to account for him. Because if you don't, he is going to beat you with his arm and he's not going to turn the ball over. Well, look at A-chain stats since the season began. 18 carries, 42 yards against Sam Houston. Not good. 66 yards against App State. Not good. You think as the schedule got tougher against Miami, against Arkansas, you or against, yeah, against Arkansas, you'd think that the stats would go down. They've gone up. 88 yards against Miami, 159 yards, eight and a half yards per carry against Arkansas. Don't tell me Arkansas's front isn't good. They've been dominant early in the year. And so as I look at Texas A&M, I'm not saying they get there. But what I am saying is coming into this year, what did I tell you? I talk to people in Aggieland every week. I go on Texas radio. And the one thing that everybody seemed to tell me was pretty straightforward. They said, look, we cannot bottom out this year. But we're really built for 2023. We have a lot of really young, talented players. We got to figure out the quarterback position. And the goal is just don't completely fall apart. So the goal is to go 9-3, and 10-2, and two, win the games you're supposed to. And if you lose to Bama, if you lose to whoever, that's one thing. Now, you don't want to lose to App State. But at the same time, most Texas A&M fans understood this really wasn't the year. It was really next year. The one thing that you could not have, however – was a complete meltdown, was complete disaster, which then leads to all the chaos that we know leads to in modern college football. Potential transfers, uh, all those five stars decide to go somewhere else. And so why I think that I, why I like what I see from Texas A&M is they're starting to steady the ship and they're starting to build back to where hopefully they should be. Now, again, you should have beat App State, so you're 4-0, you don't have to worry about this, but it already happened. And to Texas A&M's credit, they are starting to figure it out. Now, what I would say before we wrap, get to the Tennessee-Florida game, what I do think is important, I think as weird as it sounds, you can argue that next Saturday against Mississippi State in Starkville is the most important game of Texas a and schedule this year. Because the following week they play Alabama. They're not beating Alabama. If you lose to Mississippi State, though, you're now starting the season 3-3 three and three because you're not – assuming you're not beating Alabama, which means you're going into a bye 3-3 three and three, and all of a sudden, the rest of the schedule looks pretty tough, right? Still got Ole Miss. I think LSU appears to be improved. Uh, Auburn, we'll see what happens with them. We'll get to them in a second. Uh, Florida, up and down. So you lose to Mississippi State. Now you're looking at realistically probably at best eight and four. Um, and I don't know that that's going to keep people happy. But you beat Mississippi State. Now you probably have confidence. You get LSU at home. You get Florida at home. You get Ole Miss at home. You do have to go to Auburn, but Auburn might not have a coach by then. Now, all of a sudden, you have confidence. We beat Mississippi State on the road. We're probably pretty confident in every game that's not Alabama going into this year. And by the way, I think AM is going to be confident. I guess I'm just saying I'm not confident that they win. So what I would say is I don't want to keep going. You got the point. Credit to Texas A&M. And listen, credit to Arkansas. They played a good football game. Two plays did not go their way. I still like Arkansas going forward. I think they're going to give Alabama a little bit of trouble this weekend. But I don't want to completely dismiss what Texas A&M did this, this weekend as well. We're going to find out a lot in the coming weeks. But I thought this was a major step in the right direction, even if statistically it maybe doesn't look like it. All right, this is what I want to do. I do want to take a quick break. I want to come back, talk a little bit about that Tennessee-Florida game. Listen, I'm not going to do the whole overreact, Tennessee this, Tennessee that, playoff contender. They're not. But that's not really the point. The point is how far they've come and what it means for this program. I'm going to take a quick break. I will be right back. And so where I want to start is Knoxville, Tennessee. 
And this isn't where I typically start the show. I'm not going to go spend the next 10 minutes telling you that this is a program changing win and Tennessee is going to make the playoff. That's not what this is about. But what it is about is something often that I talk about on this show. And that is that too often we in college football focus on the big picture college football playoff. Who's number one, as I just told you a second ago, not often enough do we appreciate some of these smaller stories. And I do think, the Tennessee story right now is as good as any in college football. And it's really interesting, right? Because if you, if you follow this game really from about midweek until about 7.20, 7.30 Eastern time on Saturday night, this was the full Tennessee football experience really over the last 20 years. I think everybody knows, but Tennessee had only beaten Florida once since 2004 this game had so much hype coming in. It was sold out early in the week. Uh, college game day comes to town. Tennessee is an 11 and a half point favorite down to 11, but who cares? 11 point favorite coming in. And it is, it is that quintessential Tennessee game where so much good is happening. And I'm sorry, Tennessee fans, but you know I'm right. That you almost expect something bad to happen. And that was kind of the push-pull on Saturday, right? Game opens. Anthony Richardson, who had struggled all year, came in and had thrown a single touchdown pass all year, as I joked on Twitter. He looked like a right-handed Michael Vick for most of the game, okay? So in the game, uh, Florida, uh, again, an 11-point underdog. They jump out to a 10-3 to lead. Uh, they were up at 1.17-10. to And I bring it up because Anthony Richardson is playing the game of his life. Tennessee is actually playing well but they're leaving points on the board. Um, and, you know, you, you're sitting there saying, Tennessee, man, come on. You're the better team. You're frankly outplaying Florida at the half. What is going on? Get it together. And to Tennessee's credit, they did take a 17 to 14 lead at halftime. I think I said Florida was up 17 to 14. Florida's up 14 to 10. Excuse me. Tennessee takes a 17 to 14 lead going into the half. Then all of a sudden, you see why Tennessee came in as the 11th ranked team in the country. They start to pull away. They start to do what they do. They break a few big plays. And to their credit, all of a sudden, you look up and Tennessee's up, you know, by a substantial margin midway through the fourth quarter. They score a touchdown with 755 left. So about eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter. They're up 38 to 21. Okay. So I'm not great at math. 38 21 tells me this that is a 17 point game. That is a three-score game, meaning that Florida has to score three different times, at the very least score two touchdowns, convert two extra points to make it a one-point game, and then they still got to score again. And that's assuming that they can hold Tennessee's offense, which they haven't been able to do all day, okay? So Tennessee is in control. Tennessee struggled early. They're looking good. And then again, this was the quintessential Tennessee experience, up 38-21. to 21. Then Florida scores with a little under five minutes to go. Missed the two-point conversion, so it's 38 to 27. Still not great at math. That's 11 points. That's two full possessions. Is there anything really to worry about? No, nothing to worry about. It's Tennessee. We're going to be fine. We're at home. We got this. And then Florida scores again with under a minute to go, 38-33. And then they, they convert the onside kick. They get the ball back with under like 10 seconds. I think it was under you know 20 seconds to go. They get the ball back a couple plays deep pass. It's eventually batted down, intercepted to end the game, and Tennessee holds on to it. So the first of all, the full quintessential Tennessee experience. You fall down early when you're a heavy favorite. You rally back. You're in control. And then just when it seems like everything is going to be okay, Florida puts on this incredible rally, but Tennessee does hold on to win 38-33. And so it's funny because if that was just where the game ended, I probably wouldn't have led the show with this, okay? But then something struck me when Josh Heupel went to do the CBS postgame interview. And I think to me, this is why this is such an important topic. Josh Heupel, when he went to do the CBS postgame interview, I expected him to do the typical cliche coaching thing, right? Oh, you know, we, we let him in. Uh, we, we made too many mistakes late. We have to clean everything up. That is an unacceptable way to finish this game. And instead, you know what Josh Heupel did? He did the exact opposite. He said, oh, my goodness, what an atmosphere. This is college football. How great is this? This is the greatest atmosphere I have ever been in. And so his answer alone shocked me because he wasn't looking at it like everybody else did, which was just, 
Tennessee survived, take a sigh of relief. And it said something to me about who he is, who this program is, and how far he's come. What Josh Heupel was saying wasn't, hey, the 11th ranked team in the country was an 11 point favorite and we almost blew it. What he said is, we are Tennessee. We have overcome so much over the last three, four, five years. And rather than focus on the negative, focus on the fact that we gave up a lot of points late and made it closer than it should have been. We are going to celebrate this. We just beat Florida for the, just the second time since 2004. This is a cause for celebration. And it really did strike me. What Josh Heupel was telling us was, don't focus on how it ended. Focus on how far we have come. And again, it speaks to something that I've talked about on this show so many times. And I know I've said it twice, so forgive me. But we in college football, we spend so much time the college football playoff, who's number one, who's number two, who's number three, can this team beat Georgia to win the national championship, that I do think we don't spend nearly enough time focusing on the great stories outside of the upper, upper echelon of college football. We celebrated on this show, Mark Stoops, a few weeks ago and what he's done at Kentucky. Later in the, in the, the show today, we're going to celebrate what P.J. Fleck has done at Minnesota, and I will be darned. If Josh Heupel is fired up about the narrow game against Florida because he knows how big that is for his team and his program, then darn it, we are going to celebrate that here on the Aratora Sports Podcast as well. And so when I look at this win, I think about not only how important it is, second win against Florida since 2004, but that it really does show you how far Tennessee has come. And I think that's easy to forget because Josh Heupel has made it look so easy. And so what I want to do is just take half a second. What I want to do is take half a second and go back to January of 2021 when Jeremy Pruitt was fired, okay? Because when Jeremy Pruitt was fired, I think it's very easy to just sit here and say, oh, you know, it wasn't that bad and, you know, whatever, who cares? Tennessee, they're not going to win the national championship. Why do you care so much, Torres? No. Josh Heupel inherited a real mess, um, and I don't think we appreciate just how much uh, this program has overcome in a short amount of time. I'm actually going to read you a tweet from our Torres on the Vols account. Our guy Jackson crushes it on the Torres on the Vols account. Here's what he tweeted on Sunday morning. He said, 18 months ago, Tennessee was broken. Many said the program was done for and it would never be relevant again. Fast forward to today, Hypel has his balls in the top 10 and 4-0 in just his second year, many will act like this is a big deal. No, it's a miracle. Shout out to Jackson, because I don't think even me, somebody whose job it is to cover and focus on this stuff 365 days a year, realizes what this program has been through and how much they overcame. So let's go back to 2021, January, when Jeremy Pruitt is fired. First of all, Tennessee's coming off a three and seven season. It was a disaster. It did not end well. Remember, that was the uh, COVID-only season where, the, where uh, Tennessee and all the SEC played only conference teams. And Tennessee, actually, if you remember, it's hard to remember now. They actually started out pretty good that season. Overall, they start out 2-0. and Then they lose six straight games and some really embarrassing ones. I mean, they lose at Auburn. They, lose, they get punked by Florida. They fall to 2-6 and six overall. They do beat Vanderbilt. They end up losing to AM to end the regular season. And so, one, they are coming off a three and seven season. Well, that's not why Jeremy Pruitt got fired. He got fired because there were major NCAA rules violations, which we've talked about on this show. It was bringing recruits on campus during COVID, it was paying recruits before NIL, it was having his wife pay recruits before NIL. And so, you go back to 2000, the January of 2021. It doesn't seem like that long ago. But if you think about all of the residual, um, you know, whatever that Jeremy Pruitt left behind, that place was a disaster. Three and seven, major NCA sanctions looming. And I know what everyone's going to say, oh, it's NCA sanctions. Who cares? The NCA can't do anything. We didn't feel that way in January 2021. We felt like the NCA still had some teeth. The NCA was going to throw the book at Tennessee for major rules violations under Jeremy Pruitt. And so three and seven season, NCA violations coming. And what was also happening in college football at that point? Oh, the transfer portal was becoming a thing. And this is the part that I don't think Heupel gets enough credit for. 
I went back and looked up just the surface level who transferred out from Tennessee after Jeremy Pruitt was fired. Well, how about this? Their top two running backs, including Eric Gray, who rushed for over 100 yards on Saturday night for Oklahoma in their loss to Kansas State. So they lost their top two running backs. They lost their top, uh, their, their two starting offensive tackles. They lost their top two linebackers, including Henry Toto, who plays at Alabama now, who might be a first round pick in this 2022 NFL draft, 2023 NFL draft, I should say, coming up. And they lost the starting safety. So that is the surface level of who they lost off of three and 17. That is the baseline of where Josh Heupel took over a three and seven team that lost most of their front end talent. And what has this guy done? Year one, he goes seven and six. And even in that seven and six year, if you remember back to last year, there were plenty of opportunities for him to win games that Tennessee didn't end up winning. Remember, they insert Hendon Hooker late. And oh, we're going to be talking about Hendon Hooker in a minute. They insert Hendon Hooker late against Pitt. They rally. They can't quite win. If Hendon Hooker starts, they probably win that game. Uh, instead, they lose that one. The Ole Miss game, as we've talked about on this show, Ole Miss, Hendon Hooker gets hurt late. He doesn't finish the game. Joe Milton does. If Hendon Hooker finishes that game, they might win that one. And then, of course, there's the bowl game. So seven and six, but it was probably closer to an eight and five, nine and four type season than seven and six. And now Tennessee is four and zero oh right now with a win over Florida for just the second time. And so what I'm not going to do, as I just said, is completely overreact. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and say this win makes Tennessee a playoff contender. That's not what this is about. Tennessee actually has a bye this week. Then they play at LSU. Then they play Alabama at home. Then they play Kentucky at home. Then they play at Georgia. Okay, so I'm not naive enough, and I'm not going to do the overhype everything and overreact everything. And this means Tennessee is going to go 11 and one and beat Georgia. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is think about how far this program has come from three and seven with most of their best players transferring out to now four and zero in year two with a win over Florida. And let me just say this too: not only a win over Florida. Not only a very distinct brand with this exciting, fun, fast style of play under Josh Heupel, not just with an offensive savant as the head coach. Can we talk about Hendon Hooker for just half a second before we switch gears and get to some of the other stories from Saturday? Hendon Hooker is having a career at Tennessee. Listen, I'm not smart enough to know all of Tennessee's history and where he ranks. And I know they had some guy named Peyton Manning, number 16, who was pretty darn good. But I mean, what this guy has done as the quarterback at Tennessee is just absolutely incredible, okay? So first of all, just this season, Hennon Hooker is completing 71% of his passes, eight touchdowns, zero interceptions, 1,200 yards passing, okay? That is absolutely incredible. Now, again, don't claim to be a math major. 1,200 yards passing over four games, that's 300 yards per game, two touchdowns per game without a single interception. Then the stat that I threw at you on Friday's show, Hennon Hooker, as a starter, has thrown just two interceptions dating back to last year, three interceptions total, 39 touchdowns, three interceptions as the starting as the quarterback at Tennessee. And so I don't love to do Heisman stuff early, but in an offseason where we justifiably, to be clear, this isn't a knock on Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, Caleb Williams, Will Levis, uh, Quinn Ewers, Dylan Gabriel at Oklahoma. Did anyone anywhere talk about Hennon Hooker? I mean, think about what Hennon Hooker did on Saturday against Florida. 22 of 28 passing against the Gators, 349 yards. And I know there was a couple busts in coverage and blame the Florida DBs and all that good stuff. At the same time, 349 yards passing, 22 of 28. He's completing 72% of his passes this year. And oh, by the way, against Florida, he also rushed for another 112 yards and one touchdown. And so again, this isn't to say that Tennessee has arrived and they're better than Georgia and they're, they're winning the SEC this year. But too often, we overlook these great stories in college football that aren't about the playoff, that aren't about competing for a national championship, that aren't about whether this team can beat Bama or Georgia or is that this team surpassed Ohio State. No, Tennessee is one of the great stories in college football. Josh Heupel has done an incredible job. And I think the way that he reacted, the way that he reacted on Saturday tells you everything you need to know. He wasn't worried about some of the, 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 the misassignments late in the fourth quarter. 
He wasn't worried about a 38 to 21 lead becoming a 38 to 33 final score. What he was saying was appreciate this moment, Falls fans. This isn't easy. We just beat Florida. Let's celebrate. And we're going to do the same thing here on the Inner Tour Sports Podcast because what this guy has done is absolutely incredible. And I do want to wrap uh, with two really bad losses in college football on Saturday. Now, one that I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to get into Texas. First of all, I'm not going to get into Oklahoma losing to Kansas State. I know Oklahoma is really highly ranked. Kansas State has had their number. Oklahoma, all the season's in front of them, right? All the season is ahead of Oklahoma. If they win out, they're fine. If they don't, then they're just a good program that is not going to the playoff. I'm also not going to comment on Texas because to me, I know we want to do the, is Texas back? No, Texas isn't back. I saw Texas at full strength with Quinn Ewers at quarterback, and they were awesome. And the second that he got hurt against Alabama, it all fell apart. The game plan changed, and it was clear that Steve Sarkeesian was no longer trying to beat Alabama. He was simply trying not to lose to Alabama. So I don't want to talk about Oklahoma. I'm not going to wrap on Texas. But there are two very interesting losses that happened on Saturday featuring two very highly paid coaches. And it's funny, right, because I was thinking about this on Saturday. Last offseason was really the offseason where just everybody got paid. If you got a new job, if you were reportedly interested in another one, everybody got paid, but you knew that not everybody would earn their paychecks. And right now there are two guys specifically that right now are just not earning their paychecks at all. Both took very bad losses on Saturday. The first one, Mario Cristobal signs a 10-year, $80 million contract to return to Miami. Uh, Just one problem. As through four weeks, he's two and two, coming off a 45 to 31 loss to Miss Middle Tennessee State, and also Mel Tucker, who got a 10-year, $95 million guaranteed contract. He took a 34-7 loss to Minnesota to fall to 2-2 two and two on the year as well. And so I want to talk about both of them. I'm not going to do the which one is worse. I will tell you, I do think one loss is definitively worse, and it might not be the one that you think. But let's get into the two of them. Let me just talk big picture. First of all, I'll just be blunt. I'll call a spade a spade. I think the Miami loss to Middle Tennessee is significantly worse than Michigan State, both in the moment and in the bigger, broader picture overall. We'll get to Middle Tennessee in a minute, but why I think Miami is worse is for a few different reasons. First of all, I'm going to say something controversial, and if we have any Miami fans listening to this show or watching on YouTube, they're going to get mad, and everyone's going to be upset. Everyone's going to say, Torres, you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't think Manny Diaz, last year's Miami coach, was that bad of a coach. Now, here's the bottom line with Manny Diaz, and this is why I don't really believe that he was that bad of a coach. Year one, whatever. COVID year and year two, he goes eight and three. And then last year, he, in theory, took a step back at seven and five. But if you actually look at the win-loss record, how it all went down, yes, they went seven and five, but week one, they lost to Alabama. Week three, they lost to Michigan State, which in hindsight wasn't a bad loss because Michigan State, ironically, who we're going to talk about in a minute, won 11 games. But then after that, there are three losses. This is who Miami lost to last year. Virginia by two, UNC by three, Florida State by three. And one of those games, the Virginia game, they missed a field goal as time expired that would have won them the game. And so why I bring it up is because in year three, coming off an eight and three year for Manny Diaz, Miami was much closer to probably a nine and three team than they were the seven and five team that they were. And so I don't think that he was that bad. And you know who else I don't think believes that he was that bad? The Miami administration. And you know why I feel that way? Do you remember all of the craziness that resulted in Manny Diaz getting fired and Mario Cristobal getting hired for this job? And I'm just going to give the quick backstory because I do think it's important here. But early in the season, Miami struggled off that loss to Alabama. And I think it was the following week, college game day is talking about the University of Miami and Kirk Herbstreit just goes off. And, and this is not a Kirk Herbstreit criticism. I think he was probably right. And he just says, look, Miami's not committed. They're not committed the way that SEC schools are, the way that Big Ten schools are. And until they they start committing financially to the coaching staff, to the resources, to the facilities, they are not going to get back to the top of college football. And so why it was interesting is that it's it's been very publicly reported that Miami's administration was watching that, and it kind of sent off red bells, warning signs, you know, alarm bells in the Miami 
you know, facility, Miami administration. The school president goes to kind of his right hand man and says, what do we have to do to get back on track? And so they start putting together a plan. And as Oregon wins and they beat Ohio State and they have a ton of success last year, um, the plan becomes go get Mario Cristobal. And so, first of all, that's how I know that Manny Diaz wasn't that bad of a head coach, because this wasn't the traditional firing. This wasn't Clay Helton getting fired uh, two weeks into the season last year. This wasn't Ed Orgeron getting fired in early to mid-October after getting smoked by Kentucky. If you remember the Miami situation, they did not officially fire Manny Diaz until they officially had Mario Cristobal. In other words, they were negotiating with Mario Cristobal while Manny Diaz was still the head coach recruiting for Miami. He was literally on the road in homes for recruits, convincing them to come to Miami while Miami was negotiating with Mario Cristobal. And as the story goes, if Mario Cristobal had said no, then Miami just would have kept Manny Diaz as the head coach. And so to me, that tells you everything you need to know that Manny Diaz wasn't that bad because they were planning on keeping him if they couldn't get Mario Cristobal. And so first off, I don't think Manny Diaz was that bad. So that plays into part of why I think the Miami loss was so bad on Saturday, because if Kirk Herbstreit just hadn't said what he said, Manny Diaz is probably back for year four off an eight and three, and then a seven and five season with all of his players trying to figure out if he is the guy. And this is kind of the year where you would figure out is Manny Diaz the guy? Is he not? Instead, he cut it a year short. And now, you know, we'll never know. Manny Diaz is looking really good as Penn State's defensive coordinator, but the bottom line does not change that, you know, I, I didn't think he needed to be fired. And so that's one with the Mario with Mario Cristobal's loss on Saturday. But let's get into two, is that when you do fire Manny Diaz, I sort of get why you felt like you had to get Mario Cristobal, hometown kid, played at Miami, elite recruiter. But it's not as though there weren't questions with Mario Cristobal coming into the job. And part of the questions were, is he an elite game day coach? And why I say that is because he has taken some bad losses through the years. First of all, last year lost at Stanford as a heavy favorite. But overall, and I talked about this last week when Herm Edwards got fired, is that Miami, Mario Cristobal, the last three seasons that he was at Oregon, Two of those years, he went into November with a chance to make the college football playoff, to win the Pac-12 and go to the college football playoff. And they took really bad losses in both of those years. Got smoked by Utah not once, but twice in last November and December. And in 2019, had a guy named Justin Herbert and got destroyed by Herm Edwards in Arizona State in Tempe. And so I never really was a believer that, like, Manny Diaz, you got to fire Manny Diaz to bring in Mario Cristobal. He's not Nick Saban. Um, you know, he's not whoever, but now you have him, and you're starting to see some of the concerns. First of all, uh, the play calling was sus suspect against Texas A&M. And then Saturday, they just flat out didn't show up against Middle Tennessee State. And I think the biggest concern, if I was a Miami fan, I'll be honest. You know what the biggest concern is? Is that Mario Cristobal, in theory, inherited one thing that he couldn't screw up, right? You could talk about this is a problem, that's a problem, this needs to be fixed, that needs to be fixed he inherited what we thought was a first round draft pick in Tyler Van Dyke at quarterback. Just one problem. Tyler Van Dyke got benched on Saturday because he was so bad against middle Tennessee state. Right now, Tyler Van Dyke is completing 59% of his passes, four touchdowns, three interceptions. Last year, he threw for 25 touchdowns and six interceptions. So in less than four games, he's thrown half as many interceptions as he did in eight or nine games a year ago. And so if I'm Miami, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit concerned. Now, it's not to say that they're going to be terrible. It's not to say that they're never going to win anything and they're going to fire Mario Cristobal in three years. But at the same time, at the same time, I do think it's worth noting. One, the schedule ain't easy. North Carolina comes to town this week. Now, North, North Carolina, or excuse me, two weeks from now, they have a bye this week. North Carolina can put up points. Florida State later in the year. And this is the year they get Clemson. So I'd be a little bit worried if my, I'm Miami. And in the bigger picture, I think it just comes down to, did you fire, you know, a, a B coach to get maybe a B plus coach that's ultimately not going to get you over the top? I think that's a serious question and a serious concern. I think it's worth monitoring going forward. Really quickly on Michigan State, you know, Michigan State, I do think is a little bit different because with Miami, 
you actively chose to fire a pretty good coach to bring in Mario Cristobal, believing that he was the guy, the only guy that could solve Miami. Michigan State was a little bit of a different deal. So Mel Tucker did get $95 million last year, and he is 4-3 and three since he signed that contract, including back-to-back losses right now. I'm going to give Michigan State itself, though, a little bit of a pass because Mel Tucker was, at least in theory, according to reports, a very serious candidate for some jobs last year, most notably LSU, where he had previously been an assistant coach under Nick Saban. And so you could sit here and, and make fun of Michigan State and hindsight's 2020 and this and that. What was the alternative? 20 years ago, you lost what turned out to be the greatest coach in the history of college football, a guy named Nick Saban, to LSU because you wouldn't pay him. So fast forward 20 years, you don't want to make the same mistake again. So I'm going to give Michigan State as a whole a little bit of a pass, and I'm going to give Mel Tucker a little bit of a pass. A lot of things broke their way last year. I've told you before, 11-2 and overall, but four games were decided by six points or less, three of them at home. All three could have gone the other way. Barely beat Michigan, barely beat Nebraska in overtime, beat Penn State by three. And so when I look at it, I guess all I'm saying is I'm just not ready to bury Michigan State yet because I didn't have that big of expectations coming in. Now, I do think it is inexcusable to get pushed around. We're going to talk about P.J. Fleck maybe on Monday's Aaron or Tuesday's Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. I do think it is inexcusable to just get punked at the line of scrimmage by P.J. Fleck in Minnesota in a game where, I mean, you talk about just dominance at the line of scrimmage. I mean, how about Minnesota? 508 yards of total offense, 240 yards rushing compared to 38 for Michigan State. And so what I think it speaks to is, I think this rebuild is probably a lot bigger than a lot of people anticipated. I'm not going to bury Mel Tucker. I'm not going to say he's terrible. Um, I do think Kenneth Walker bailed them out of a lot last year. Uh, there were issues. The secondary was not great. Peyton Thorne, their quarterback, was up and down. Now we are seeing a team that has problems in the secondary, problems at the line of scrimmage, problems at quarterback without that elite running back. And part of what Mel Tucker was was hired and retained to do was elevate recruiting. And so we will see if he does that because I just think right now he doesn't have good enough players. And what I would say about Michigan State, um, as bad as it was, it could get worse because guess what? They are actually a, a – basically a pick them in the Betfred Sportsbook against Maryland this weekend. Then how about this? They get Ohio State, they get Wisconsin, they get a bye, and then they play at Michigan. So even if they win this week, I think you could be looking at a very realistic scenario where they are three and five coming out of November, coming out of October into November um, when the schedule gets a little bit easier. So I'm going to give Michigan State a little bit of a pass. I don't think the school had much of a choice. I do think it is not a good deal right there right now for Michigan State. But that said, I do think it is time for me to get out of here. Long Monday edition of the Aaron Tour Sports Podcast. But this is just what we do, right? This is just what we do, baby. Before we get out of here, I want to remind you, make sure to subscribe to the Aaron Tour Sports Podcast. Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure that you are subscribed to the Aaron Tour Sports Podcast. Also, make sure to subscribe on YouTube. New episodes go up every day at 9 a.m. Eastern time. If you miss it on podcast or if you download it on podcast, but go back and listen on YouTube. Uh, Aaron Torres, you can find me on YouTube. Very easy to find me there. Um, Make sure to rate and review the show. If you can go on the page and give me a quick rating and review, it really does help. Uh, A couple of you are still asking. We're going to get a new mic this week. We're hopefully going to get any, um, you know, I don't think the sound is terrible, but I think it, it will be better by the end of the week. And then I think we just rock and roll. October is always a busy month on this show. Cannot wait. By the way, we're getting closer to college basketball. So I think it's going to be a really fun couple weeks and months on this show. And I appreciate your guys' support. That is all for our Monday episode of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. And it is time for me to get out of here. Shout out to Torrent Craig. Shout out to Rachel who hates my voice. Shout out to JJ Reddick, you F head. Unblock me. I'll be back on Tuesday. New episode of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast.